Look at this priceless expression on little Harold's face as he hears sound for the first time in his life. We all have seen videos of little babies responding to their mother's voice when they hear it for the first time. And those expressions, emotions and feelings are simply priceless. Most of us in our day-to-day -day lives don't really sit down to think about or appreciate our sense of hearing. And I'm here to tell you why you should be doing that. So how do we hear? When sound waves enter our outer ear, they pass through to the middle ear and strike the eardrum, depicted in blue here. From the eardrum, these sound vibrations are transmitted to the middle ear bones, which further transmit these vibrations to the snail-shaped structure in pink here called the cochlea. Within the cochlea lies a flat sheet of sensory epithelium, which comprises cells important for hearing named the hair cells in yellow here. Look at these hair cells in action. These hair cells are actively sensing sound in the rat inner ear. When I say hair cells are actively sensing sound, what does that mean? Hair cells convert sound waves into electrical messages. Now the way they do this is, when sound waves strike against the hairs or the projections on hair cells, there is a deflection that is caused. This deflection leads to the generation of electrical impulses, which are then integrated from across all hair cells in the organ of Corti and passed on to the brain through the auditory pathway for sound perception. Now that process is comparable to this Mexican wave here somewhat. Now imagine that each individual here is a hair cell. Now you see that they're moving their hands just like how hairs move on the hair cell. Even though each individual is moving their hands and the movement is local, you see that the wave and the information in the wave moves from one end to the other. This is exactly how sound information is transmitted from the ear to the hair cells and then the brain as well. Now coming to hearing loss. The death of these important hair cells is what causes hearing loss. Hearing loss is important because it's a major public health issue and 43 million Americans suffer from this condition and it's the third most common disorder in the United States. There are a variety of factors which contribute to hair cell death. Now these include infection and injury, noise, age, genetics, some kinds of medications too. What about treatment options? Are there any? Cochlear implants and hearing aids are available to manage hearing loss, but not really to treat it. But regeneration of hair cells is a potential future option to restore hearing. And that's what I'm gonna tell you more about today. What do we already know about regeneration? We know that non-mammalian vertebrates like amphibians, fishes, and birds can regenerate their hair cells naturally. Now, what you see here in front of you is an image of the chicken in a year. And here you see hair cells are intact. Now, on application of loud sound and certain kinds of medications, antibiotics, hair cells die. And within just three weeks, there is regeneration and the hearing of the bird is also restored. This is what we mean by natural regeneration. What about mammals? In case of mammals, such natural regeneration of these hair cells does not occur. Now this is a perfectly intact inner ear of the mouse. And in the damaged condition, the hair cell loss is permanent and so is the hearing loss. Now, when we say we do experiments in mice, especially when we have to study mammalian inner ear hair cell regeneration, we use mouse as the model organism. So we need to access the mouse's inner ear. So here's a little bit of technical detail. How do we start from the mouse and get to the inner ear? So the mouse is 3.5 inches in length. Zoom in closer into the head region. The box here indicates the bone containing the inner ear and once we isolate the bone, we perform dissection to 
dissect out the cochlea and from within this cochlea further, we micro dissect that sensory epithelium called the organ of corti. Now this organ of corti has the hair cells and the non-sensory cells. Now most of the images further in this presentation are going to be images of this organ of corti comprising hair cells and other cells. Remember, this is a very tiny structure because completely stretched out as well. This is just about 0.25 inches in length. Now coming to my research central question. The question that I wanted to answer through my research was, can we convert non-sensory cells in the mouse inner ear into hair cells? And I decided to answer this question by comparing results at two different time points one in young animals and the other in slightly older animals. So this is comparable to a time point of infant versus toddler when we talk about humans. So when we say non-sensory cells in the inner ear, what do we mean? What are we talking about? Taking a step back, reminding you of structures. If you remember that red sensory epithelium from the video on which the hair cells were present, if I cut a section through that tube and I look at it from the side, this is what it's going to look like. You're going to see one row of inner hair cells, three rows of outer hair cells, as indicated by one inner hair cell and three outer hair cells here in dark gray. And the remaining light gray cells that you see surrounding these hair cells are all the non-sensory cells within the inner ear. So these are our target cells now. So what are we going to convert these non-sensory cells with? We are going to use a protein called 801. Now, 801 is a transcription factor protein, meaning it binds to specific DNA regions and induces the expression of hair cell specific genes in the inner ear. So how was 801 even identified? When scientists were studying the development of hindbrain structures in the mouse embryo, they traced the expression of 801 and found that 801 is a hair cell fate specifier in the mouse in a year. Meaning all sensory cells which express 801 go on to become hair cells and all those cells that don't express 801 remain non-hair cells. It's as simple as that. So now we know that 801 is what we're going to use. So how are we going to do this whole process of switching on uh, 801 and non-sensory cells? We're going to use a tool called the Cree Lock Speed tool. So the Cree Lock Speed tool is used to switch on specific genes in specific tissue in mice. Now imagine a situation where I give you instructions to go into your home, go to a particular room within your home and switch on a particular light. The same way the Cree Lock Speed system works, where your home is the mouse's body. Me giving you instruction is the injection of a compound called tamoxifen at the required time point within the mouse. And you following this instruction and doing the task is the Cree protein, which is also present within the mouse. And the Cree protein now goes to a specific tissue. In this case, that tissue is your specific room. And that light that you turn on is the specific gene that is turned on. In our case, this is 801. So using the Cree Lock Speed tool, non-sensory cells are going to have 801 switched on in them at a particular time point, which is in one day old mice. So in one day old mice, when 801 is switched on in non-sensory cells, this is what you get. So this is a confirmatory image of successful switching on of 801 in a variety of non-sensory cells in the inner ear. So when we switch on 801, give it some time, what do we see? Well, what we see, what we see is pretty amazing because when we switched on 801 in one day old mice and analyzed the years of these mice a week later, what we saw was that a large number of non-sensory cells had converted into hair cell-like cells. Now, I would like to call these hair cell-like cells reprogrammed hair cells. This was a pretty exciting result for me. I was sitting 
uh, in front of this microscope, staring at this very screen, at this very result, three years ago. And that moment has been one of my best PhD moments so far. So the next question that I asked uh, from this result was, how good are these reprogrammed hair cells, especially when we compare them with normal hair cells? The first experiment I did here for answering that question was to look at the hair bundle structure and morphology. So to do that, we collaborated with uh, uh, another lab at the University of Michigan and they performed a technique called the scanning electron microscopy technique and captured some images for us. And what we saw was that the hair bundles present on a reprogrammed hair cell was very similar to that of the hair bundles present on a normal hair cell. So they were alike and this was very encouraging to begin with. Next, if hair bundles are similar, is it possible that reprogrammed hair cells also have sound sensing activity channels? So to answer this question, I performed an experiment called the FM143 dye uptake experiment. Now the principle of this experiment is simple. Any cell which has sound sensing activity channels simply takes up this FM143 dye and is fluorescent. And this time frame is as less as 10 seconds. So when I performed this dye uptake experiment, I saw that all the reprogrammed hair cells took up the dye within 10 seconds and were fluorescent. So this gave us the confidence that the reprogrammed hair cells did have some sound sensing activity channel presence in them. Now the next set of characterization I did of these reprogrammed hair cells was based on markers, immunostaining for markers. So the first set of markers I did the staining for uh, were specific to inner hair cells and outer hair cells. Now taking a step back, how do inner hair cells and outer hair cells compare with each other? Now even though both of them are hair cells, Inner hair cells receive 95% of the innovations within the cochlea. Basically, they get 95% of the load of the neuronal projections within the cochlea and the remaining 5% goes to the outer hair cells. So when we did the immunostaining, what we saw was that all these reprogrammed hair cells that we were making by switching on 801 were in fact inner hair cell like cells because they stained positive for the inner hair cell marker and not for the outer hair cell marker. So that was encouraging. Now we decided to do the opposite where we wanted to see if every reprogrammed hair cell attracted its own neuronal projection to form connections with them. And when we checked for the presence of these neuronal projections, we saw that indeed these reprogrammed hair cells were able to form such connections and collectively they were innovated. So all of these results sort of told us that these reprogrammed hair cells that were coming up were very similar to normal hair cells. Next question that we asked was, does switching on 801 recapitulate developmental events? Now let me take a step back and explain something. So during the development of the organ of CORTI in a mouse embryo, what happens is for every hair cell that comes up, there are specific adjacent supporting cells that come up. Now the function of the supporting cells is to maintain and help in the function of the hair cells. Even though they are not sensory themselves, they help in the maintenance and function of the hair cells that they line. The image in front of you here is the base of and in a hair cell that you're looking at. Now, if you see, there are two unique supporting cells, the inner border and inner phalangeal cells here, which line the inner hair cell. Similarly, outer hair cells have their supporting cells too. So what we wanted to know was if these reprogrammed hair cells were more inner hair cell-like, does that mean they have unique supporting cells, specific supporting cells coming up too? To test this, we stained for the inner phalangeal markers and we were surprised to see that for every reprogrammed hair cell that came up, there were adjacent inner phalangeal cells too. So this told us two things. One is that switching on 801 also recapitulated developmental events and two that 
non-sensory cells not only responded to 801 by converting into hair cell-like cells, but they also converted into unique types of supporting cells. So this was overall very encouraging for us. So with that, I'll summarize the first part of my work by saying that when we did an extensive characterization of these 801 mediated reprogrammed hair cells obtained from non-sensory cells, we saw that these hair cells had mature hair bundles, they had sound sensing channel activity, they were inner hair cell like, they were innovated and they had adjacent supporting cells regenerate too. Okay, so coming back to that central research question, what about the next time point? What happens when the animals are slightly older? Are we still able to use 801 and get reprogrammed hair cells or is something different going on? So if you remember, in the first set of experiments, we activated or switched on 801 when the mouse was one day old. But in the next set of results that I'm going to show you, the activation was done when the mouse was one week old. And the analysis was done a week after that when the mouse was two weeks old. So when we activated 801 at one week old and analyzed at two weeks, we were surprised to see that a switch in just one week of age showed absolutely no reprogramming effects at all. We did not see reprogrammed hair cells come up at two weeks in the older mice. So this was really surprising because this told us that 801 basically did not have the ability to produce reprogrammed hair cells when the animals were slightly older. Now, what could the reason be for such an observation? We went back to read some papers to discuss and think about what may be going on here. So 801 acts in combination with other factors in multiple uh, different tissues to bring about specific cell fates. This is no. So 801 is not unique to the inner ear. 801 is known to be involved in specification and, pre and expression in granule neuron cells in the cerebellum, secretory cells in the gut, and so on. So is it possible that we need additional factors to act with 801? Only then maybe the reprogramming will happen in older animals? Well, we had to test all this out. So what we did in our lab was we generated these three mouse lines. Now these three mouse lines basically are combinations of these three factors. So the first line A is just 801. It's very similar to what I have been talking about all along. The second one is GFI1, 801. And the third one is GFI1, 801 and pau 4 f 3 Now. GFI1 and POW4F3 are two targets, downstream targets of 801. And both these are transcription factors too, and they are known to be important for the maintenance and survival of hair cells in normal inner ear development and older animals. So we know that both these genes are important for hair cells to be hair cells. So the logic behind using GFI1, 801, and POW4F3 is such that all three genes have an important role to play in the life of a hair cell. So that said, the different combinations here, as you can see, do not really involve an 801, POW4F3 combination. This is because both are pro-neural genes and uh, we really did not want to test two pro-neural genes because it will simply lead to an additive effect of individual factors in question, that is 801 and pau 4 f 3 So we decided to just stick to these three combinations and see what we get. So when a similar kind of Crelox P activation was done, so when I say activation, we are switching on these factor combinations in the non-sensory cells again, but this time in older animals, what we see here as depicted by the arrow is only in the three factor condition, that is when 801, pau 4 f 3 and GFI1 were switched on together, did we see a large number of reprogrammed hair cells, but in case of just the 801 and GFI 801, we didn't see reprogrammed hair cells come up at all. This was a surprising result that we saw. 
Now we went ahead and characterized these older reprogrammed hair cells again, which came up in the three factor condition. And what we saw was that these older reprogrammed hair cells did not stain positive for inner hair cell or outer hair cell marker. So the arrows here indicate the reprogrammed hair cells and you can see that they don't stain positive for either hair cell type. So what does this mean? Does it mean that they are more immature? Well, we don't really know. However, we still went on and characterized these hair cells for some other properties just like before. We saw that the older reprogrammed hair cells are innovated, meaning they attracted neuronal projections to form these connections and that they also had, there was also evidence for uh, the presence of unique supporting cells lying adjacent to them by the sheer density of the inner phalangeal marker staining that we saw indicated by arrows here again. So all of this still tells us that maybe these three factor induced reprogrammed hair cells are still immature. However, we are still doing some experiments to analyze what these older reprogrammed hair cells are like and what is different between these reprogrammed hair cells and the one week reprogrammed hair cells that we got before. So to summarize this part of my talk, I want to show you this representation here. So simply what you're saying here is that whenever you give non-sensory cells in older animals, just 801, they are unable to scale that regeneration roadblock indicated in red. And there are no reprogrammed hair cells produced after one week. However, when the same non-sensory cell has all three transcription factors, 801, GFI1, and POW4F3 switched on in them, they're able to scale this regeneration roadblock and turn into a reprogrammed hair cell within one week time. So with that, this work also opens up a lot of other additional questions like, okay, you're getting all these reprogrammed hair cells in young animals as well as in slightly older animals. So how long do they survive? Can they hear? Are they functional? What about adding many other factors to get more reprogrammed hair cells? What about the frequencies that these hair cells can hear? And so many other such questions. Well, we don't have the answers to any of these right now. And that's for the field to take forward in the future. Now, as I said before, hearing aids and cochlear implants are strategies that are available now to manage hearing loss in humans. However, we hope that through this work, we will be able to have uh, fine tuning in gene therapy approaches to treat human hearing loss in future by employing these reprogramming factors in question, that is 801, GFI1, and POW4F3. And hearing restoration is important for an enhanced quality of life be it in the young or in the old. Thank you all for listening to this talk today.